right, well, we're live. Live at five. Good day. Tonight, tonight, Matthew, we're doing a bit of terrain modelling. Uh, I've actually painted all of the... If you are there, say hello. There's a couple of people watching at least. Do uh, drop a message in the... Uh, in the in the live chat uh, we've got quite a few things here today i need to probably sort some of these bits and pieces out uh, i've just got some uh, french figures i was finishing off these are the last of the initial uh sec group uh, bunch that i had there's uh, six of them left over but it's musicians and guys with flags so i don't really need those immediately uh, tonight I'm going to try to work on this. Evening all, evening friends of General Haig. Uh, still painting 17th century uh, Polish hussars. Excellent. Good, good. Evening Andrew. How are you doing? You all right? Uh, and I was just saying that this is probably going to be the uh, thing that I'm going to be tackling tonight. Uh, and also these walls as well, which I uh, built scratch built from uh, various bits and pieces. I'll show you these. The reason I, I built these, painting Austrians again. Nice looking building. Yeah, it's um, Empires at War. It's on, in their uh, Normandy range, but I thought it looks, uh, it'll work perfectly well for everything all the way back to uh, Evening Joe, uh, work all the way back to 18th century and prior to that. And what I want to do with that I'll talk about those walls in a second. I want to do with this is uh, I've got this stuff, uh, the wall tile grout. I uh, picked up the idea on um, Luke APS's channel. He was He's building some MDF buildings at the moment. And one of the things he did was to uh, use tile grout just to give it a slight texture as though it's been plastered. And because this has got some details and things on the front of it and this etching and stuff, uh, I didn't want to use actual uh, plaster, so I'm going to go with the tile grout, see how that works. That's going to be our experiment for tonight. So I'll just put those to one side for one second. And the walls, the walls are far more important, actually. This is more pressing. So these are the Hugamon walls, or close enough to, because I did buy some other walls before, but they were just too small for my needs. So these are perfect. I'll show you. I got a load of Eureka's uh, 18 mil figures through today as well. So another bunch of French. Uh, so to give you an idea of the size of the walls, there you go. It's a figure against the size of it. So I want some really tall walls. These will also be perfect in use in um, anything, again, after 18th century, really. So I could use these in 20th century factory walls or town walls and things. Uh, but what I want to do is basically I've built about 14 different types of them. I did initially think about putting onto uh, onto bases, but I realised as I was building them because it's th uh, th five mil um, mounting board. You can probably see it there that it's actually wide enough for them to stand up on their own. Now they've got the brick paper on them as well. And Joe, you were asking where the brick paper come from, came from. It's a guy in uh, in Greece. I just found, uh, literally all I did was look for embossed brick paper. Uh, I took my wallet this time. Yes, I did. I went back and I took my wallet. Uh, I don't think they recognise me. But uh, yeah, I went back and I got I got everything I needed from Hobbycraft. So it was literally mounting board, uh, styrene. It's a bit thicker than what I would normally have. Uh, I think this is 5 mil or maybe 3 mil. I normally use two mil styrene sheets, so it's not great for uh, basing figures. Uh, but I noticed that when I built the corners, one of them is just slightly off the others, just because I just made a slight mess of it. But it doesn't matter because I've got tons of uh, brick paper and I've got tons of mounting board left, and I just needed a very quick fix for this weekend, and this is basically it. Evening, Kevin. Good to see you here. So what I'm going to plan to do here is, because I use Plasticard for the um, 
the tops here, the, uh, the 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 mounting slabs, I guess they are. I want to paint those in some kind of stone grey, just clean up some of these edges and things where I've just gone over. And then I'm going to paint the edges of these as well in uh, a brick red initially. I did think about uh, putting strips of uh, brick paper around, around on the inside, but that's going to take forever and I, I just, to be honest life's too short it might be something i'll come back to in the future however uh i'll uh for now the quick fix is i'm going to paint these in a brick paint so that's what i'm going to do tonight i'm also going to paint the tops i will weather them i'll probably just give them an agrax wash initially and maybe a maybe a, a slight dry brush over the next day or so but uh, for my needs for this weekend at least these are going to be perfect so we'll crack on with that joe what did you say i'll be following your walls to make mine next week excellent uh well it is a very boring job and it did take quite a while but i managed to get there joe so stick with it and it's worth it as i say i've only i've done 14 long pieces uh these are 15 mil obviously so just to give you an idea these are uh let's see these are 10 centimeters long and three centimeters high uh with a little bit three 33 millimeters high because they've got that little capping stone on top uh i did as i say i did think about putting them on bases the problem is when you put them onto a base you've got that little bit you have to really either cut it back as a triangle so that you can fit them together in corners and also when you've got that base it's difficult to put them together like that in corners but when they're just like this you can basically just pull them up against anything and these are pretty you know they're, they're pretty sturdy enough to stand up i think i don't think they're going to be falling over uh, anytime soon but the weekend will be the test the other thing i want to do as well is actually build the gates as well for the for the the uh, gate itself for the for this so i've got a, a piece of plastic card already cut out to size evening paul would see you here uh, and then this i'm going to just basically scratch build a uh, gate onto this using uh, some more embossed plastic card that i've got here so that's uh evening wardrobe that's kind of what my plans are for this evening well as i say this this is taking precedence over the building hopefully we'll get to the building at some point but right now i want to get these brick walls done and dusted as much as i can so they're, they're at least usable yeah give me says copyright sturdy <laughs> fair enough right and so evening steve right first things first is deciding on what colors to use as i said first of all, i'm going to use brick red uh this is a humbrol paint that i've got kicking about somewhere because i moved all my desk around for doing these live streams everything's disappeared and i don't know where it's all gone now but there's some brick red paint somewhere uh source for the walls scratch built i'll just go over it again for you it's literally a uh, mounting board and plastic card and brick paper so uh, i don't know if you can see the mounting car mounting board in the center there uh, i don't know if it's but that's basically strips of mounting board with brick embossed brick paper stuck on top and then a uh, three mil styro styrene sheet cut into size and scored so that it looks like it's got uh, it's different slabs gone on top there uh, so when i uh, when i dry brush it and ink wash it you'll be able to pick out the the lines of the uh, the different blocks on there so as i said the first thing i need to do is is get this brick paint on this is uh humbrol really old paint that i've had for years it's rc402 if anybody's interested one day I, like i say one day i probably will come back and i'd rather than paint this edge i will probably add brick paper to them i just i couldn't face it after doing so many of these uh last night and after work today so i just decided that i'm going to uh I'll leave it for now, and as I say, get them done to table standard, ready for for the weekend. Uh, Crossing Obstacle Gaming, hey all, hey to you as well. Thanks for joining. So, as you can see, this is 
uh, as it says on the tin, it is a brick red. Uh, I'll probably give this a dash of Agrax once it's dried. But all I want to do is really just to minimise the lines of white on the edges of these. Uh, just so when they're standing on the table, you don't see because your eye is instantly uh, drawn towards that white colour. One thing I would say is when you are building these, make sure you use an incredibly sharp scalpel or knife or something. I've got an exacto blade. I think they call them in the States. And I just use this to go through them. It's a slow process. And I think if I was doing more, I would have actually done something different to what I did do. Because I initially cut out the uh, the block of mounting board as 10 by 3 centimetre pieces. And then I stuck the down onto brick paper and then cut that out. What I would do in future is literally just stick all the brick paper down onto the slab of... Uh, of mounting board if that makes sense and then cut out each one it would really speed things up that way i think but you know lessons learned the next time i build a load more walls for hoogamon then i've um i know what i'm going to be doing as i say, this is just a pretty simple process at the moment just filling in those edges just taking away that white as much as possible Oh, and I also I use PVA glue to stick the brick paper onto the uh, onto the mounting board because obviously it being paper on paper it's quite a good bond and for the sticking the styrene boards onto top onto the top of the the things I used um, a hot glue gun uh, which I got I think from eBay or Amazon or something. Uh, I think the last couple that I did aren't, aren't as straight as the ones that I started because I was getting fed up by that point. Uh, so this one here is just slightly off, but what I might do again, at some point is just go back, pull it off and reset it. Uh, as it stands at the moment, I'm not so bothered because I'm not going to use all of these anyway in my sharp practice game on Saturday, I shouldn't think. I'll be using a, a good number of them, but not all of them. I just wanted to make a... So I was looking at the hovels. They do a really nice Hoogamon set in 15mm. I didn't want the full set. I just needed the walls for Joe's scenario of resupplying Hoogamon. And I figured they would, they would be good to use, but uh, as hovels take forever to actually send anything out because they have to make it all, uh, they wouldn't be here by Saturday. So unless there was a... I was going to a show or something. I wouldn't be able to get what I needed. It's a bit of a shame, but that's where we are. As I say, these stand up pretty well. Just on their own, under their own weight. Not that they weigh anything anyway. But uh, they're going to be a nice addition. And easy to work with. I think what else I can tell you about today. Yeah, what else did I get? Oh, I got these. Let's say I got some more from Eureka Miniatures. Uh, I got the AB 18mm uh, French. So I basically doubled the amount of French that I painted recently. I got a British ammunition cart as well. Unfortunately, that doesn't have a horse or anything or riders with it. <laughs> uh, it wasn't particularly well advertised on there on their product page and I thought I was getting at least a horse and a and somebody riding it but obviously not uh, so that is going to be pretty useless but I have another cart which I'll be using in the scenario on Saturday uh, but it's, it'll, it'll be useful it'll be useful in the future I'll just get a horse and, a, and some riders and it'll it'll all come together I'm sure of it uh, but the funny thing with Eureka is I'd ordered these this stuff about three weeks ago and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. I knew you know because of COVID and everything, it, things are slow and obviously, you know, these things aren't always people's first job. So when it's somebody's hobby, you've got to give them a bit of leeway to get the stuff together. But as, as ever, I just sent them a message just the other day and just said, uh, can you just give me an ETA on 
on when you think these things might be might be coming and then literally got an email back <laughs> and then the next uh, later on that day i got uh, your process your order has been processed and posted <laughs> well sometimes occasionally i guess people just need a nudge <laughs> it was quite funny uh do i know which anglo allied force am i using yet are you going for the random roll of, uh, option i am using the nassau joe which is why i've been painting them uh they're all done and ready they're ready to go they are shout out sham uh, that's the uh that's the the, the main thing uh you will have seen seen me painting them well you have because you saw me doing it uh is my game going live are you going to ar later uh it's going to be an ar later kevin um uh, i don't i've talked about doing live games i was talking really uh with my wife about it and earlier on as well and the problem is the camera that i've got that i can use which is this one is only a webcam so it's good for close-up stuff like this but not good for wide shots which you need for a uh, a game really uh i mean i had it on for um virtual lard and the the actual image is not great it's a bit grainy after all as i say as it gets further away so it's going to be a bit difficult uh, that said it's something that I've got in the back of my mind as to do live games in the future. What I'll need to do, though, is buy a, a good camera for it. So I, uh, I'm i going to need a, a big, like a, like a digital SLR that runs uh, runs like a webcam. So uh, I'm going to save me pennies for that, basically, because uh, they're about 300 quid. But it will be very useful. Because the camera uh, that I do do my ARs with, the uh, Panasonic one, is it's not uh, you can't use it as a webcam, unfortunately. So I'm kind of stuck really with it a little bit. But it's certainly something on my mind that I want to do that I want to experiment with. I mean, probably what I would do is do a couple of hours of gaming a day at a weekend or something, you know, just to rather than doing a, a full like eight hour stint just do a bit of it and then come back so people can drop in and out and also so i just don't get tired as well that's the other thing uh uh excellent don't know if you saw the office of dutch <laughs> bloody edjo edjo uh, i didn't notice no uh, i painted him as nassau am i uh Am I breaking the rules of the scenario, Joe? I watched a couple of games with you in and enjoyed them. Cheers. Which games were they? Kevin, the ones from Virtual Lard? Or the ones I... If they were ones from Virtual Lard, they were the ones I was a participant in. I did pull up the other one as well. I named it after him. As a thanks for helping with the lads. <laughs> yeah, go, uh, helping with the, sorry, with the lists, not the lads. The lads on the brain. Uh, it's always nice when you can do things like that. You can put somebody in a game, isn't it? How much input did uh, did Nick have in the, uh, with the lists? Uh, some of these have started to come a little loose from the the hot glue gun, so I'll probably have to go back at some point and just refix them back in. As I say, for now they'll be all right. I just want to get them kind of painted up at least, and then then they're done, done nice and easy. I mean, we've got fifteen people in watching. If you are there, say hello. Don't be shy amongst friends tell me what you're painting tonight if you're painting anything nice to know eric Endler, hello hello eric good to have you with us and i've been thinking about 
uh, live streaming as well and just making it more of a uh, a fixed thing in the calendar rather than just doing them randomly like I was kind of doing last week. So I was thinking possibly Thursday nights and Sunday nights are probably maybe the best nights really. It's Thursday, working and lurking, good stuff. Uh, Sunday nights are... Um, Everybody wants to go. Uh, not looking forward to going back to work. And uh, Thursday nights are just midweek, aren't they? It's a bit. Uh, it's not the weekend yet, but it almost is. Uh, Nick wrote the uh, plan to know scenario. The rest was mainly me with some input from the committee. <laughs> everything's about everything's down to the committees. It's great. It's a great piece of work, Joe, and it really inspired me to uh, to buy sharp practice. And it's a game that I've been meant to, to get into. Uh, Thursday night, the weekend starts here. It certainly does. Uh, the because I've always had my eye a bit on sharp practice, but uh, I'm not that not particularly fussed about the Peninsula War. I know there's probably you could argue there's more scope for scenarios and gaming and stuff, but. In the hundred days war, there's plenty of little conflicts and things. Fred, thank you, looking good, man. Thank you very much. Uh, there's plenty of scope for for little conflicts around the actual main fighting. Uh, before, during, and after the the main battles, even you know, there's plenty of outpost actions, isn't there? And people resupplying various areas and stuff. So it's. Uh, it's good for that. What I might do is look at get some Prussians as well and do the other two scenarios that you wrote or that you have in your article. Plain Team Plastic, Games Workshop, Dark Spearmen, former Kings of War, Twilight Army. Last unit to finish for this army. Okay. I have literally no idea what they are, but if it's what floats your boat and if you like it, then it's more power to your elbow. That's what I reckon. This hobby's big enough for all of us. I should think. So, I'm literally just, again, as ever, splashing this stuff on. I really need to trim that one down, actually. Yeah, like I say, all of it, I'd because I was scratch built and I was kind of doing them pretty quick, I've buggered up one of the corners, but it doesn't really matter. I'll, uh, I can either go back and make make another corner or just trim uh, a couple of them down so they're all about the right size. So if I need to, I can make a uh, four-walled um, stuff, a four-walled uh, courtyard. And it's quite a big area that it covers as well, which is good. Uh, and the same, Waterloo has been a love mine since I was a kid. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pretty cool stuff here, Wardrobe. Cheers. Um, Waterloo was always my favourite ever, ever since I was... When I first got into wargaming, I used to get the uh, Eshi 172nd scale figures. And uh, I've got none of them left anymore. And it was always the Napoleonic Wars that I got. I think it must have been because I probably one one day watched Waterloo on the telly uh, one Sunday afternoon, most likely. But to be honest with you, it's probably before that. But I used to go to the library and get out loads and loads of kids' books on the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, they used to have them in then. Richard, uh, we are Kevin. Will you be in the background playing? Uh, Will you have in the background playing Sharps Waterloo? <laughs> uh, if I'm honest, I've never watched a single episode of Sharp. Uh, I've probably watched about half of one, and that's been about enough for me. I, I really, unlike a lot of war gamers, I can't stand it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Richard says he's doing Afghan MDF buildings at the mall. Nice uh, terrain building. Never, never hurts. But yeah, I've always always had an interest in the Hundred Days campaign. Although my most of my wargaming output these days is Second World War, and the Napoleonic period has always been a period I've been interested in. So, so my first Napoleon, in fact, my very first war game was with Napoleonic figures. Uh, I was at school, and uh, my 
we had to do a like a, a show and tell thing in English class. And so I took in my Eshi figures because I've been painting them. And I basically said, this is what I do. Well, I just I was just painting. All I do was paint them. And one of the guys in the class, young chap, Jonathan, he said to me, do you war game with them? I said, I don't even know what that is. So I was probably about 12 maybe then, I think. Uh, right, that's all those edges done. And he said, and he introduced me to it, and he said he did micro tanks, and he explained to me what, how the games worked and things that you know you basically move stuff around with uh, tape measures and you you fire at each other with dice and things. And I kind of took this, and I would, and I took it home and I did, and I thought right, I'm going to come up with my first rules I ever I ever came up with. And what you did was, uh, I'm kind of going off a 30 year memory now, but. We basically set up 50 figures either side. I think I had British, and the guy who was with me had French. And we just set them up. They weren't in any formations, uh, anything. They were just literally all over the table. And the rules were you could either move uh, move one figure six inches or fire, and you rolled a D6. And if, you had a, uh, if, if it was for every inch that you fired – you had to roll above that. So if you're firing at one inch, you had to roll above a one or above, two inch, two or above, etc. all the way up to six. But you could fire anywhere on the board at anything. And that was literally the rules. Uh, so it was like one figure at a time each side. <laughs> uh, God, talk about uh, old school. What we're saying here, Steve said, did Waterloo is a 172nd miniatures about five years ago at the club over a Saturday. But that was good fun. Uh, I was an Eshi Zulu war gamer back in high school. My starting to the hobby. Yeah, I used to have some of the uh, Zulu war stuff as well, uh, the Brits and the Zulus. And also when we were at school as well, what Americans would call high school, comprehensive for us, uh, one of our teachers was a war gamer and he used to let us sit in the class, his class over lunchtime and have a war gaming club uh, while he did marking and stuff like that until one of the Meathead PE teachers came and shut it down one time because of health and safety concerns. You know, we were just in there enjoying ourselves. But we used to uh, refought uh, the Waterloo campaign on school tables <laughs> uh, in 172nd. But we were only using like, you know, one or two units. But we fought every battle. So my big, my big, uh, my big initial love was definitely for, um, for Napoleonic. And I kind of drifted into the Second World War, but Napoleonics was always there in the background. So I'm just trying to find my stone grey now. I've got one, but it's an old one. I don't know if I bought a new one. I thought I had. The problem is with, with historical gaming is you end up with a lot of greys and browns and greens. And they all look the bloody same until you get them out. One day I should really just go through and, and organise it so at least I know what the the different colours are. I can see them. Uh, well, we said, Steve, I had every unit represented on the tables, 14 uh, by 6 uh, by 4 foot tables using black powder. Great fun. I'll bet it was. Paul Morris, my first war gaming, other than rolling marbles of figures, was using Lego blocks with our homemade rules. Nurse Day's 10. Brilliant. Wow. You're a little bit younger than I was when I started. I was like, so I was about twelve or thirteen. I've got some photos. They're on my blog actually. If you go onto the Storm of Steel blog and search for the archaeology of wargaming, you'll find my old uh, some really old photos of uh, a refight of Waterloo that we did with Eshi figures, one seventy second. Uh, God knows what what the formations were, but you know they were they were kind of there. But yeah, it was uh, good times. So my interest has always really been around that 100 days campaign when it's come to the Napoleonics. It feels a bit like it's like, uh, is this, uh, I don't know if it's if it's vanilla or not, but eh, I like it. That's all that matters, isn't it, at the end of the day. I can't find my other stone grey, so I'm going to have to go with this one and hope there's some in it. It doesn't feel like it. Uh, you mean they're not organised by Vallejo rack number? Oh my God, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. 
far from it they're barely organized if it's all it's quite a state let me show you in fact squad leader too never played squad leader obviously i'm i'm aware of it but that's the state of it that's what i'm going to try to find <laughs> so wish me luck when i go in there squad leaders was incredibly complex wasn't it binder binder full of rules but that's how games were played wasn't it back in what was it, the 70s was it released right so the next thing to do is because this is just the white plastic card i want these painted in as i say stone gray so this is just a simple really simple task of literally painting this on and then i will give these a wash in hygrax just to give them a little bit of uh what's the word uh depth i might i might go back and dry brush them as well at some point but it's most likely just going to be an agrax wash and that'll probably be that'll do for me i think what do you say there steve we have 24 models per foot regiment 12 per cavalry so a load of figures on the table yeah i'll, I'll bet um my, the organizations we had were based on the on the boxes that they came in <laughs> so it was like uh, i think we had 25 in a in a unit uh, but i um i ensured that all the posers were uh, were the same ones in each in each um each point in each each of the uh what's it called in, in, in the areas of the the unit that they were in they were always the same pose but we used every pose it wasn't like some people who um you know who just picked out the marching ones and got rid of the rest we used everything even the ones laying down <laughs> all mixed in together great uh squad leader was originally very simple rules asl went to the binder ah was it so squad leader was the the original yeah i've not played that either <laughs> can't really remember what uh, what war game board games we used to play i had a copy of uh, avalon hills i think it was a hundred days campaign actually but i never read the rules or understood them uh, i've been looking for a copy of it ever since it was uh, the small box version and it had the painting of uh, scotland forever on the cover i had that one was about 12 but i just couldn't understand the rules at all so i couldn't i couldn't do abstract thought i didn't understand it <laughs> I didn't realise that, you know, you were supposed to take account of the, each of those uh, little squares being something like 25,000 men or whatever it was. Uh, I played advanced squad leader. I think I enjoyed it, but I never completed two turns. <laughs> Detail junkies heaven. Yeah. Yeah, I got more and more complex for each scenario. Only got three or so before giving up. Yeah, I mean some people love it they thrive off it don't they 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 i'm i'm a complete opposite abstraction for me please uh where else we are we bought a hex and a counter game at christmas for the first time in 30 plus years i thought the rules would be simple oh god no <laughs> no definitely not uh we used any 172nd medals we could get our hands on at the time yeah they were plentiful what was the uh, hex and counter game that you had? I don't. I don't think I own one. I've got lots of board games, but they're what what are generally loosely termed as Euro games. So stuff like Carcassonne or Pandemic. You know, more more generic, not really war games. A couple of war games, but not many, like uh, Quartermaster General and things. Uh, have i played john tiller's back battleground wars on our pc no but i'm aware of it uh i have seen it but it's very expensive so i've just not put it off uh closest i've got i used to play a couple uh years ago there was a talent soft one uh the name escapes me but it was a, a waterloo game uh, i've also got napoleon total war as well uh, which i know is not you know historically correct but it's good fun uh, I find those kind of games, those big 
like the John Tiller type games uh, to be too complex to be honest I just like to get in there get fate in you know if if counters been taken off immediately it's like what do you mean I've got to attack them again how does that work well like I say we got 15 people on board now give us a shout tell us that you're on the battleground waterloo was a title one time and soft one yes that's the one andrew yeah that's the one i had uh it had little videos didn't it of um of, of troops marching and things when you moved figures of when you moved the the units about and it played the french uh, imperial guards marching stuff and that bit i remember the talent soft one is that they also had prelude to waterloo and napoleon in russia yeah there's lots of videos yeah evening terry good to have you here uh i remember seeing that in the mags i never saw it in real life hmm. as i say i like uh, i'm just painting the tops of these these walls now because I drew on them to, to mark them out earlier on. So I'm just trying to cover those lines up. So I don't know if you can actually see that I did uh, mark out individual capping stones on them as well. So like I say, once I've washed them in Agrax, they should they should uh, show up pretty easily. And that stone grey is really nice. It's a really nice colour. Uh, it's not exactly grey and it's not exactly green. It's somewhere in between. Use it for quite a bit of things, actually. Uh, this is yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the game of sharp, sharp practice. I've been reading the rules for the last week. A lot of it is similar to Infamy, which I'm familiar with. There's an Infamy AAR coming this week, actually, tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but yeah, there's a um, but there's there's the subtle differences which that's the, <laughs> the thing with bloody games is uh, a lot of the core mechanics are very similar but then for each one it's just slightly different <laughs> uh cry havoc is available as a print and play now okay i don't know cry havoc uh, one of the other Avalon Hill games I used to play a lot was uh, B17. I got that as a print and play. You just reminded me, Andrew. Fantastic game. Uh, the reason I got into it is because I went to triples one year. Again, probably about 13 or 14. First time, I would, or maybe the second time I've been to a wargaming show. And there were some guys who had a 3D... Uh, a 3D uh, version of B-17. So basically they had a 17 bomber in the centre of the table and then the German aircraft, as they appeared, just came on as models at the various points of the compass. And as I was walking around the trade stands, I saw somebody selling a second-hand copy. So I went and bought one because I enjoyed playing their game so much. Uh, I'll send you QRS for use. Ah, cheers, Joe. Thank you very much. I did print one out from the Lardy's website already but that's mainly the bad things happen table and uh fisticuffs i think but yeah anything like that that'll help that'll be great just want to send it uh, if you uh, if you want to dm it to me through uh, twitter or something that'll be great very helpful thank you i mean looking at looking at the rules anyway it's all pretty simple stuff like the Brilardi games the the basics like the, the you know the firing and the hitting and stuff you can just do, keep it in your head anyway and most of that follows over from pretty much every other Lardy game. It's just the the little nuances, really. I like the cards in Infamy, the way that you can store them up and, and use them throughout the turn. Uh, can I have a uh, send it through? No worries. Ours is very clear and concise. Excellent. Good stuff. I like clear and I like concise. <laughs> The, uh, for the for the harder thinking like me but yeah if you send me a copy through that'll be very useful 
one day I will uh, I will get a chance to actually play some of these games with my mates. <laughs> I don't think it'll be far off, but it's still a while off at the moment. Uh, sad that triples died, Richard Hogg. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, I think it was a it was a slightly bloated though, wasn't it? It was a two dayer, and you know we we used to go. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to go for both days. And then as I became an adult, I just couldn't cope with two days, that's it. So we used to go on a Sunday, and it was it was pretty dead, to be honest, on a Sunday afternoon. So it was no wonder it was uh, it was it was falling falling to piece, pieces. Uh, what was the last in-person game I had? <laughs> Funny story. Uh, this was last year, in fact, last summer. Probably towards the end of summer. I can't remember exactly, but it was towards the end of summer. We played. Um, I went to my mate's house and we played Quartermaster General uh, Cold War. This was just after I think they lifted the first lockdown, and my mate was shielding because his wife's dad is quite old and, and was susceptible as well, so he was shielding, so he wouldn't let us in the house. So we had uh, a three-player game. I thought, right, well, I'll take a three-player game. You know, it's an easy setup. There's no messing about. And it's a good game as well. Uh, and we set it up, but, we, but he, he wouldn't let us in the house, so we had to play in the garden. And the wind was kept blowing and picking everything up because <laughs> it's all uh, cards. So cards were getting blown everywhere. And me and the other mate, Dean, we kept saying to each other, if I longer was somewhere we could sit... That had you know walls around it, <laughs> but yeah, uh, he wouldn't. I mean, you know, fair enough. He was looking after his wife's dad at the end of the day, but it was a bit farcical, really. If I'd known that we were having to sit outside, I would have taken a game with heavier pieces. <laughs> but that was the last one, I think. So yeah, it's a long time ago. We were actually talking about doing it in about a month or so, but at the moment, I'm so. Uh, pretty cautious at the moment about going out and about and stuff uh, because I think you know we'll probably just hit a, a third wave in the next couple of weeks and I know all you know there's issues about people needing livelihoods and stuff I know all that but I'm just erring on the side of caution I think for a little while uh, Richard says used to shop on Saturday and work out which games to play on Sunday. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you noticed as well, Richard. There was a, uh, they felt like there was a huge drop off in participation games towards the end of it. Um, like I said, when we used to go when we were kids, I was more more inclined. I say kids, teenagers. I was more inclined to to play uh, everything and anything because it was a chance to play games, you know, that we didn't normally play in the year. So uh, we would pretty much jump on any game you'd spend all day and all day Saturday and Sunday doing it because I didn't have enough money to spend anyway so it basically meant that uh, I wasn't spending any money on either day really once I spent me three quid or whatever it was but um, yeah we'd spend loads of times playing but then the last few times that we went I mean I'm not that fussed about doing participation games myself but uh, I just noticed there didn't seem to be that many most of them were display games and I wonder if that was a part of the demise as well. You know, it's you're kind of looking at people just with static displays on. There's not many, if there's not many people trying to get you actually involved in it, why, what's the point in going, you know, once you've seen everything? It was something that we always thought was noticeable every time we went for the last, at least the last few times we went. But Chilcon. Is out and about now on uh, at Sheffield, and that was good. Uh, uh, there was a great one, thirty-five scale Mad Max one year. Oh, I don't remember that one. Oh, I bet that looked pretty good. I've seen a couple of nice Mad Max games with the truck and everything barreling down the road. Uh, they look great when they're done properly. Uh, I kind of got into uh, Gaslands. Because of the Mad Max vibe, Fury Road really like it. Should play more Gaslands. 
It's a good, good, fun beer and pretzels game. And I've got a load of uh, Hot Wheels cars sitting in a box waiting, waiting, waiting to be painted. I know I could just use them as they are, but, you know, I like to weather them and, and make them mine. One year, I don't know if you remember this, this, this is going back quite a long time ago uh, at Shripples, there was a 135th scale Second World War game uh, based on Cross of Iron. And we played in that, and I played. I always played uh, Sergeant Steiner, and my character got drunk and then started singing, as he does in the film. That was that was a good laugh. I can't remember who it was that was hosting that. It might have been Sheffield War Games Society. Really don't know. I remember it well. The uh, the Cross of Iron game, or the uh, or just triples in general, Richard. Demarcation. <laughs> that was it. I, I think that was I was instructed to shout that as well as <laughs> as as part of my my character. <laughs> they had like one thirty fifth scale Shermans and stuff on the table as well as part of the game. And it was all yeah, it was in a built up area as well. It wasn't on like uh, a forest or anything. So it had loads of buildings and all sorts of stuff that really went to town with it. Hey, yeah, the cross of iron board was ace. <laughs> good kill. <laughs> yeah, it was a good one, that. I'm glad it's not just me that remembers it. I can't remember who it was that, that hosted it, though. Well, I'm getting through these. The thing I find with, with doing stuff like this with terrain is you've got to do a lot of it to make your table look any good. And it's something that I've really kind of fixated on a bit more in the last few years. I was looking at the the old photos I did of my Malaya boards seven years ago when we started doing the rapid fire campaign of the Malaya campaign, and and they're just they're awful. The tables are terrible. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not the the best terrain builder in the world now, but I can just see that there's a vast improvement even in just seven years of actually you know concentrating on on getting stuff on the table that looks good it's not shouldn't just be figures but the problem is because you need a lot of it a lot of it is very similar like these things incredibly boring to paint uh individually they're fast but you know when you've got 14 of them to do it takes a little while and then there's some people that go even crazy like pair will will do hundreds of things at once from roller one but they're quick enough i like to find shortcuts which is why i've got the uh, the brick paper because it's it half the work is done basically the rest of it falls into place after that yeah. come on we've got 17 people here Chip in, say something if you're there. I'll, uh, I'll run out of things to say if you don't keep asking questions. <laughs> Pear is a bit of a madman. No, he certainly is. Uh, his uh, his output is incredible. But you just got to be disciplined. Uh, that's all it comes down to, isn't it? Discipline and, you know, if you're doing a project... And you want to see it through, you've got to keep cracking that whip and going at it. Really going at it. But I always think as well with stuff like this, you know, once you've done it, you've done it. And you don't need to go back to it. Uh, I mean, for me, the lockdown has been great because I've just managed to get a load of stuff done out of my lead pile uh leslie bailey tipping says evening what are you painting what scale and for what game uh discipline and madness all those six mil figures yeah absolutely uh i am painting the walls of hoogamon or the walls that are like the walls of hoogamon that i scratch built uh yesterday and today and uh this is for 
uh, Sharp Practice, which I'll be playing on Saturday. It's the uh, one of the scenarios from the Waterloo campaign that Joe McGinn wrote, which is resupplying Hugemon. So I quickly built some scratch-built walls for uh, the game specifically. And that's what these are. So that's tonight's project, is to get these finished. Uh, and I'm looking at hopefully trying to get that building there as well, at least textured tonight. But we'll see how we go. Uh, Richard says, you're currently having trouble with your PVA spray bottle. Uh, I find that. I bought some cheap spray bottles, and they're pretty crap. They either get blocked up or the me mechanisms in them just stop working. So I try not to use them too much. Getting tiling grout in your eyes. Mm. Yeah, that's probably not good, is it? I don't think. <laughs> I don't think it's meant to do that. What are you doing with the grout, Richard? Are you, are you texturing buildings as well? Same as Luke Apps's, uh project uh, video from the other day. Can't believe I'm the only one that, that watched it. I'm sure everyone has, has seen it. He does some good stuff, uh, that guy, Luke. Really good terrain builder. Been watching some of his stuff for quite a while. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, it's, um, yeah, buildings. Uh, Leslie says, are you going to base the walls so that they do not keep falling over during the game? No, because they stand up perfectly well on their own. The only reason these ones are falling over is because I'm messing about with them. Uh, they're thick enough to actually stand up because they're light as well. I did think about basing them, but then I thought, They'll stand on their own on their own two feet, so what's the point? Uh, if in the game they do fall over and it gets annoying, then I will reconsider that. But right now, they work perfectly well for my needs. So we'll see how they go. But see, stands up perfectly. The only ones have fallen over are these ones because I knocked them. And that one because I knocked it. <laughs> and those ones because I knocked them. <laughs> uh, let's get more of this on here. I'm almost done. There's only four left to do, thankfully. I'll say I'll let them, let them dry. I'll probably stick Agrax on them tomorrow and then maybe give them a very quick, light, dry brush just to bring out the edges of the uh, of the tops of the walls. And then they're pretty much ready. Uh, after, after I've game with them, I will reconsider putting brick paper on the edges as well. But as I said, I didn't really want to go cross-eyed today, so I decided not to do that. Let me just show you the difference between how they started. So that edge there, you can kind of, once they're together, that red brick in between really just blends into the, I think there's no white lines there, which is quite nice, which is exactly what I was going for. Uh, pimping and basing Blitz MDF Middle East buildings. Uh, yeah, I think I've got a couple of Blitz stuff. I haven't got any Middle East ones, but I've got some of their other bits and pieces. Uh, Andrew says, are you going to Salute this year? I would like to go to Salute. The uh, problem is from where I am, it's ex expensive. Uh, Ian Fuller got me some free press tickets uh, in 2019. So me and my mates, we were able to go down because my mate, his father-in-law, was working for network rail so he was able to get cheap tickets i probably shouldn't say this in public but he was able to get cheap tickets for us as well and uh we basically so basically uh, it was it was quite a a cheap trip out really otherwise i think it's about it, it ends up being something like about 100 pounds return from the train from up here from sheffield uh which obviously is quite expensive even just before you've got, even got in the door 
But if you can get in, if you can buy tickets early enough, train tickets, I mean, uh, you can get them relatively cheap, probably down to about 30 quid. Les says, unfortunately, I did not. I'm in France. I've not played in Bristol for many years. Club used to be down the centre of town. Not as expensive from here. No, I'd say not. Uh, gone to Big last year. Was that the one that the Lardies were at, Big? I think I was listening to one of their podcasts from uh, last year, and they were at Bristol, a Bristol event. Listening to their their latest podcast talking about storage and things. The ah uh, uh, yeah yeah the eternal struggle of buying more figures yet having nowhere to put them. I swapped over to the uh, really useful boxes uh, last year. It cost a lot of money, but it's the best storage solution I've had for. Uh, the figures. Uh, you had an interview there. Uh, I probably heard it then, Joe, but I probably didn't put two and two together at the time. <laughs> I do apologise. I'll have to. It means I'll have to have a listen back, doesn't it? I can see here where I've gone wrong with the with the hot glue gun underneath these. You can't actually see it from above, but I can see where. I think. I accidentally turned the whole glue gun off halfway through trying to glue these things. So the glue was setting as I was actually spreading out everything. So you need them really hot. And for some reason on my hot glue gun, the actual, the on off button is right next to the, the trigger. I'll show you what I mean. I got a big hot glue gun, first of all. And I saw... I think it's Midnight Miniatures or something. He was using one of these ones, so I tracked this down. It's a really good one. It's only small, but you see there that the uh, the on-off switch is literally where your hand would be. So it's easy to turn the thing off halfway through your, your gluing. Uh, let's have a look. I just finished off in 28 mil buildings, Viking Saxons, sprayed the roofs of PVA and flocked them to look like grass. Nice. And this afternoon, finished off a few shields with my Vikings for Raven Feast. Excellent. And Steve says, you use the really useful boxes as well. Which What size do you use, Steve? I've got uh, nine litre for figures with um, Sally Forth's uh, things in them, for, um, trays and commission figurines trays in them. And, I've, and I use, I think it's 18 litre for scenery. And they all stack up really nice, really easy. Uh, I was organised to go to Amsterdam for the Rosai events. Got cancelled. Were you going to Amsterdam? I wasn't going to Amsterdam. That question was directed at me. Uh, I didn't even know about it. Um, Paul, you've said, never been to Salute. Expensive to travel and it's in the that the London. I can spend my money and much more wisely at my local shows. There is that, and I I, I have a, an agreement with you. Like I say, I probably would never have gone had I not got a, a free ticket to go as press um, from Ian. It was never – well, it's kind of like, you know, it was always I should go to it at some point. But that said, it is a fantastic show. Really, really good. Uh, the – the level of, of stuff that's on display is fantastic. And also, I know you're up in the north like me, but the different traders that you see there, because there's obviously, you know, traders only travel a certain certain distance. So there's so many in London that, you know, we, we, we in the north probably don't even see or know exist. So there was loads of stuff down there that that was that really you know that the, the, there was interesting and it wasn't just the games that were on display uh crossing up school says kim we should try our raven fees also since i just finished playing my vikings i played it the other day and it's good fun uh very good fun uh steve you have the 418 and uh, 24.5 litres, four for the small scale stuff, large for the 28 mil. Yeah. 
Uh, right, that's those bits done. Four and nine liters for you. Yeah, I think I've shown you. I've shown you my really useful boxes before, haven't I? I'll show you them again. There's some of them. You can see the figure piles behind them, and then there's some more on the other side as well. You see those by the bookcase. So the the ones at the front there. There's two layers of those full of scenery, and the, those ones there, they're all full of scenery as well. And then the, the smaller ones you can see at the back there, full of figures. And then I've also got these ones here behind me. Sorry, try and keep it straight. They're full of Napoleonic figures and stuff, and some Second World War as well in there. And these ones, as I say, I got those trays. I got 35 mil deep trays, they're perfect for 50 mil figures. You can pretty much fit most things into them uh, apart from some of the stuff with really tall flags but most stuff fits in right that's all the stone grey done on those so that's good that's one step towards Hugamon uh, the next thing I wanted to do was now scratch build the fence so for this Check that, it's probably my wife. Yes, it is. Just reply to her. And let's see what else we said. Uh, been to Salute a couple of times. It is an experience, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Perhaps not every year thing, yeah, that's what I think. Um, it was also around the time that I started filming shows as well, and I noticed that uh, the, the the film of Salute got way more views than any of the other Wargaming show uh, videos that I did. So people are obviously just interested in it, or, you know, if they've been, they want to see it again, remember the stuff that they missed or whatever. Uh that's been one of the main annoyances for me for the uh, lockdown, amongst other things, obviously, is not being able to get to shows to film them, to put them on the channel to get the numbers up. But the AARs have taken off instead, so can't complain, really. Right, that's all. I'm just stick them to one side for a second. Uh, salute is great for me. I haven't missed a salute since the late 70s. Wow. When it was at Chelsea Town Hall, i.e. before it moved to Kensington Town Hall, Olympia, and then XL. We've seen the development of all of it. Uh, been to several salutes. Used to love the bring and buy. Got some right bargains, I can imagine, yeah. Uh, a little squiffy from the vaccine at the moment, so let's hope the War Games Club can reopen soon, miss real people. It'll happen. It'll happen. It's going to have to happen. You know, we'll, we'll, be back on, we'll be back on it before you know it. And all this lot will just be a bad memory. But it will happen. Uh, you went to salute once, Kevin, uh, whilst on a course war studies <laughs> some years ago. Excellent. Uh, a good opportunity to do so. So what I've got here is some embossed plastic card. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it's in light or not, but it is actually, it's, it's got very fine... Uh, lines on it so I'm already working off a grid so what I want to do is basically just build the frame of the uh, the the gate itself so I thought it's going to be a lot easier just to do it with this already I've already marked out my centre point for the gate what I'm doing is I'm not I'm not cutting this all the way through. I just want to mark it out. So again, when I come to dry brush it, I can. Uh, it will pick up that little etching there. Uh, yeah, you. Everyone, I think everybody misses in-person gaming. Really, clubs open on the twenty-third of May. A game already arranged. Good for you. Good for you. Right, what I need to do then is also put etch the plankings in. So I'm just going to do these, but these are just going to be relatively random. 
so it's literally just a, a case of using the the knife to to draw lines down it they don't need to be too deep let's say i just want enough of an impression of the the planks for the uh, for the thing itself and that's a good thing with this styrene it's easy to work with it's very nice so i'll work back as well on the other way what you're saying <laughs> you're always talking too fast uh, are you reading the rules for raven feast and looking forward to playing yeah it's uh, i played a quick game of it because i've been meaning to for a while and it is it's good fun uh, that's an aar that's coming along soon in the next couple of weeks might be the next one after this week's actually so maybe next week so i can't remember where it is on the list uh been really good to have command and colors gloomhaven jaws waiting to be played with real people as well yeah command and colors is a great game and Jaws looks like good fun as well. I wouldn't mind having a crack at that myself. Paul says you miss face-to-face -face games as well. Last one was February 2020, yeah. Although we Zoom game once a week. Yeah, you were talking about that before. Oh, I didn't tell you all, did I, that uh, Paul was very kind to send through a load of Japanese and 14th Army British for Burma, so... They're on the list of things to do soon. I'll be uh, getting those together. I was looking at those the other night, Paul, just to see if what they were organised into, what units there were. Uh, but what I'll probably do is uh, make them all into individual-based ones, and then I can use them in chain of command. Uh, but I might do some of the 14th Army as well in multiple bases, so they can be used in whole group or in they ain't being shot, Mum. I'm going to have to have a little think about it as to what I'm going to do with them. But they will get used, don't worry about that. So, there we go, right. Uh, my club is already gaming, but I can't afford to go in person gaming as I'm high risk. Yeah, I think gaming can wait, Andrew. I mean, you know, it's still going to be there when, when the risk is low. That's what I think. It's not worth it. Uh, getting a game in this coming Sunday, excellent. So, you probably can't see that because of the light, uh, but I have actually uh, been, I have actually uh, scored them so you can actually use, I can, uh, it looks like there's planking on it now. So the next thing is literally to cut these out. Uh, what are we saying? Uh, we're in confinement till the beginning of May. Uh, not to go further than 10k from home, all bars, restaurants, and most retail other than supermarkets. And even having uh, clothing, having clothes and fenced off, etc. Yeah. Different countries, different rules. Uh, Paul says, I'm glad they'll be used. They certainly will. They'll be definitely used. Sorry, just concentrating while I'm cutting. Well, see, the last thing you want is this to turn into a horror show with blood everywhere. I think that should be enough. There we go. So that's thin enough now to turn into different into planking. Uh, wood coffee stirring sticks works wonders for planks of wood. Yeah, it does. Uh, not at fifteen mil though, fortunately. <laughs> A little bit thick. If it's 28 mil, <laughs> no blood, please. No, don't worry. If it was 28 mil, 100% uh, agree with you. But yeah, at this scale, I need something slightly smaller. And whilst I was in Hobbycraft, I also got some uh, cement as well. Liquid cement. Because I was running down on it. I actually probably ended up spending as much in Hobbycraft today as I... Uh, yesterday, sorry. Uh, as I... As I probably would have done if I'd just bought the, the ones from Hovels that I was going to buy. Never mind. Blood for the blood rod. <laughs> spruce for the spruce their own. <laughs> Indeed. He demands a sacrifice. But not from me tonight. So 
know, this should be a nice, easy little fix just to make a nice little gateway. And as I say, this is, I'm making it, it's meant to be Hoogamon, but I'm making it as generic as possible so it can be used as something like a factory or uh, any any other kind of industrial, large size urban building as well. Because one of the few things I don't have on my table is walls for some reason. The club is hopefully opening up in July, so I'm looking forward to that. Oh, my gaming partner is not going back. Oh, that's a shame. There must be others you can game with, though. I'm sure you'll find plenty to game with. I joined a club just before the lockdown last year. I've not been back since. Right, killer. Never mind. Just measuring these on uh, by eye, really. Just making sure they kind of fit up a little bit. And then that happens. You don't actually get it in the right place. I don't really mind them being particularly rough either because I want them slightly rustic. Shall we say? Well, we said here, I've sacrificed on your behalf. I stuck my wrist, my average needle. Apply me. Easy. <laughs> Be careful. Question for Paul. Did you do you do reenactment World War One? I? I can tell you the answer to that. Yes, he does. <laughs> or at least he did. With a certain Mr. McGurk. The hero of the North. Right. So now we just need this central part. Yes, did late fifteenth century realm in twenty five years and yes, we'll have one. You did. In fact, I've got a photograph of you at uh, triples. All dressed up in all your clobber, you and McGurk. That's a long time ago. Let's see if this actually fits in there. Oh, it's close. Yeah, it doesn't look like tonight. I don't think I'm going to get that that house done, but we'll say that for another time. There you go, last triples you was out. Yeah, that'll be the picture it's from, I think, because it was definitely it was triples. You were next in the Napoleonic reenactors, weren't you? Again, one of whom I know, <laughs> or I knew, I worked with him once. So that's the first part of the gate. <laughs> Closing the gate at Hugemon. Uh Did it win the battle? Uh, there's, there's many factors to winning a battle. I think is the uh, is a short answer there. Uh, it certainly helped win the battle uh, because the farmhouses were key to Napoleon's uh, strategy on the day. The houses of farmhouses of Hugemon and La Haye Saint, and if you because uh, Hugemon was on his flank basically uh, and overlooked, so he didn't want a strong position there. But yeah, they fought for it for, for days, and he basically just dragged more and more French soldiers in throughout the uh, throughout the day, throughout the fighting. You don't look at doing World War One reenactment, but that scene isn't very big in Sweden. No, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised the Swedes even know First World War exists. But 
can we go? I've got a little bit of a better way of doing this now. I'm thinking about it a bit more. Which, uh, which, uh, which side would you go for the reenactment for for the First World War? Uh, crossing obstacles. Britain, France, Germany, Hungary, Austria, Russia, Belgium. Uh, we did look at it as a project for Centina. We're looking at doing something earlier in the future. What was that, Paul? The uh, Waterloo. Here we go. Have you got your painting mojo back yet, Paul? That's the question. It's a question on everybody's lips. Are you doing some painting? Probably British. Oh, reenactment, yeah. Good stuff. Any particular year? Or just in general? There we go. So that's the front of the gate done. Nearly finished the unit. Excellent. That's good to hear. So this will then eventually slip into here. He says, hopefully. If I got my measurements right. It looks like I need to trim a bit of this down. But that's basically going to sit in there like that. And once that's painted, Black Watch, First World War reenactment. Interesting. You like the early war more than the late war. Okay, I keep bashing Empire Valley Cannon later. Nice. Uh, an 18th century invalid battalion. <laughs> uh, do you know Martin Stiles? Uh, they, uh, they they did the uh, the, the catering core. <laughs> That's reenactment. As he says, the army marches on their stomachs. <laughs> Most important formation in the army, really. <laughs> Probably true. So we've got. I just need to snip. I didn't realise how much of this would actually get used up. I thought I'd have enough for doing both sides of the of the gates, but obviously not. We've talked about reenacting an 18th century invalid, but I've already read that one out. I did uh, English Civil War, Saxon, SHE, and World War II from 80 to 2010. A lot of reenactors out there. I guess there's a point where you 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 get to where you, you you're only. You get to an age where, where it just stops looking realistic, I guess, isn't there, really? And maybe the waistbands as well are probably not the same as 20-year-old as soldiers. Um, French Napoleonic. It must be quite good as well, I guess, for all those different uniforms and things. It's 
something I've never never been interested in pursuing really is uh, is reenactment. I mean, if it's what floats your boat, then fantastic, go for it. But just never never been bothered about it. I guess it's the cost really, as much as anything else. I'm sure you soon rack up big bills with all those, all the bits of equipment. You're always adding to stuff. You were offered a place in the Invalid Battalion. <laughs> Small world, eh? All brought together by my live streams. There we go. It's funny how the first first time you do it, do something like building the front of this gate, uh, it takes a little while, and then you realise all the shortcuts you can take for the second one. Oh, seven years war, well, not she. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder what the she was. Right. Into place. So, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. I can't remember, but I, I was thinking about trying to make these live streams a bit more um, uh, regular. So, rather than just doing them every couple of days or whatever, and probably. Oh, we, we talked about it already, haven't we? On why? Why am I repeating myself? Probably because I'm tired. It's ten to ten to nine. What is? Uh, oh, the drinking. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's the expensive part as well, isn't it? The drinking. So yeah, probably. I think I'm looking at probably maybe doing Thursdays and and Sundays. And then I can set it up and just they can just go from there. And then people can just will know when to come in rather than me just putting a post up and what what's Andrew? The uh the live stream that Andrew was talking about I might make them more regular. Uh I mean make them on a Thursday and on a Sunday. So people know when to to catch them. Really, you like the live chat format, yeah? I like it too. It's nice to to work away on stuff and know there's other people sitting there doing things as well. It's all good. This helps me do a bit of painting. It works for you. You will show up with each one. <laughs> good stuff. Well, I'll have an audience of at least one then. And that works for me. Right, so last little bits of these. Because I've obviously used glue on this, I'm going to have to leave it to dry for a bit <clears throat> before I can do anything else. So I'll probably not be able to paint it till tomorrow. But painting won't take long. It's a few minutes job. Uh, Thursday, Sunday sound good. Paint and chat is fun. <laughs> uh, you met your wife reenacting, so you got your money's worth. <laughs> yeah, good investment. <laughs> Mutual interest. <laughs> There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Done. 
a good investment in these, but you don't have to explain your hobby to her. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Half the work is already done. <laughs> Don't forget, if anybody's interested, actually, next week, next Wednesday, I'm doing a, uh, a talk about battlefield archaeology for the um, Westminster Count, uh, Libraries, an online one. It's free as well. I think I posted the the link a while back. I'll repost it. I'll stick it on Twitter and probably on, on my Facebook page as well, The Storm of Steel. So if you're interested in signing up, it's free. Peter talking about the stuff I've done in France. Hey, your father-in-law was a war gamer as well. Perfect. What a family. I bet your mother-in-law was happy. <laughs> right. So that's that's our gates basically done. As you can see there. Actually, that's all it is. Pretty simple. Uh, you paint you horse, yeah, she's painting table with the other half. She sometimes paints war games figures. She does all of my horses. Yeah, Amanda's horses are fantastic. The uh, very few that she's posted in the secret nerd room are brilliant. Really good. Right, so now. Just going to put a little tiny bit of detail in. Uh, Joe says, great, I'll keep my eyes peeled for the link. Yeah, I'll, I'll post it up. It's next Wednesday. It's, um, as I say, it's, a, it's an evening thing. Uh, towards the time, I'll, I'll stick the link up. And I'll dig it out. There we go, we've got a little bit of a what looks like a lock or something on the on the gate there. Keep those nasty Frenchies out. What's the plan? So <clears throat> doesn't look like much at the moment, just looks like a lump of styrene with some other styrene stuck on it, but once it's in place and painted it should look a lot better i'll just make sure it fits in there you go the back gate to hugemon and there's the walls what time for five to to nine uh i'm not going to attempt the grouting tonight i was going to i think i'm going to We've been at this for an hour and a half, so I think I'm going to leave it at that. I've kind of achieved everything that I wanted to. I just pile wounded French drummers up behind the gate. That'll keep them out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Looks pretty good now. Cheers, Andrew. Uh, forgot to ask, is a brickwork English or Dutch pond? <laughs> uh, it's English garden wall. <laughs> uh, Dutch pond is um, every other layer, I think, is uh, is as a header rather than the stretcher i can't remember I, it's been a long time since i've done any industrial archaeology but you have to know this kind of nonsense in that as well so really all i need to do for these now is paint that gate uh and then i'm going to wash the tops of these with uh, agrax but like i say i'll, I'll do that tomorrow because it's a reasonably big job and then probably just dry brush that off as well just to give it an edge and then that's them done really that they're, they're ready to go they're ready to go on the table so i'm glad i managed to get those done tonight uh in a bit of a rush but you know needs must as the devil drives and all that and on that i am going to say good night i think thanks everybody for tuning in it's always appreciated and uh relive the uh, the stream on the channel later on when the uh, when the video is processed but uh, as i say i'm going to try to make these a bit more more regular 
and I'm looking at probably doing a Sunday and a and a uh, and a Thursday night, uh, probably from next week onwards. So good stuff. Thanks for joining in, and uh, I shall see you on the other side. Goodbye.